Valve have long been the face of PC gaming, and I'm sure there's a generation that only know them for Steam, but there was a time where they pushed the boundaries of game design and tech with games like Half-Life and Half-Life 2. And around a month ago, something very weird happened. Something that pretty much never happens. We're so glad you're here. Yeah! Portal and Portal 2 are coming to Nintendo Switch! These are the first console ports Valve have done in over a decade. Unless we count the Nvidia Shield, which I'm sure we all own. So today, I want to look back at every console port Valve has ever done. Not just because I find it interesting, but because some of them have exclusive modes and features, and one of them has better visuals than PC. So you might find it interesting too. So this was actually one of the first GVG videos I wrote. This script's been lying around for over a month, and I wrote this before Portal was announced for the Switch. So if you're in the future, you tell me about that. But for now, I don't want to look forward, I want to look back to a radically weird time. Gabe Newell wasn't exactly subtle about his thoughts on the PlayStation 3. Like, the PlayStation 3 makes my life as a software developer much harder. Valve didn't even touch the PS3 port of the Orange Box, that was done by EA, whereas the 360 version was done by Valve in-house. They just hated PS3. But then at E3 2010, this happened. The flying surprise in 3, 2, one. So, what changed? Money. You telling me Sony were paying third-party developers for exclusive content towards the end of the PlayStation 3 generation? No way, baby. They wouldn't do that. But yeah, despite Valve not being involved with the PS3 orange box and Left 4 Dead skipping the system entirely, Portal 2 was there day and day with every other version. And not only that, but... Take it away, Gabe. Uh, that will make the PlayStation 3 version of Portal 2 the best version on any console. And he was right. Not only is Portal 2 on PlayStation 3 more fully featured than the Xbox version, but there's actually content more easily accessible on PlayStation 3 than PC. In fact, you've probably never tried these levels on PC. But we'll get to that in a sec. What made this port better than 360 was Portal 2 on PlayStation 3 supported Steam. Not only did it come with a Steam code in addition to the disc, but you could log on to Steam directly from your PlayStation 3, chat with all your Steam friends, get your PC cloud save, earn Steam achievements, and most importantly, play with Steam players. I am talking in the past tense though, as... Oh dear. The Steam support was never actually announced to be cancelled for Portal 2. They announced it for Global Offensive, which is another game we'll talk about later, but never Portal 2. Weird. So you can't actually log in, and all you can do is read news posts, which is funny because now the PlayStation 3 is advertising the Switch. A lot of the huge merits of this version existed in the past, and without any Steam support, Portal 2 just doesn't work like it used to. On 360, it's all Xbox Live, everything works like it did 9 years ago. But here, you can't even find PlayStation 3 players online anymore, as that also worked through Steam. If you want to play co-op, it has to be local now. 360 not only still works online, but it also got a 4K backwards compatible update. Kinda sounds like this is the definitive console version now, right? WRONG! The PS3 version supports PlayStation Move. Now don't click away, hear me out, this is very, very cool. There's two cool things. Cool thing one, you can play the entire game like a Wii shooter. Think Metro Prime 3 or the Call of Duty games, this is rad as heck! Portal's not exactly a game that needs fast reflexes, but it's so comfortable to play like this, and the PlayStation Move vibrator head thing changes colour depending on what portal you fired last. You telling me you're not buying this? But alright, here is the big deal. Portal 2 In Motion DLC. This is £7.99 on the PlayStation Store and gives you entirely new levels built specifically around motion. So what does that mean? It's just pointing, right? No, you can do this. It's like they fused the portal gun with the gravity gun. You can now pick things up and push the PlayStation Move controller forward to stretch out your reach, or pick up blocks and stretch and squish them to make bridges. You can pick up portals you've placed and rotate them to fit in gaps they usually can't fit in, or shift them around to make gel fly everywhere. Portal 2 in Motion introduces actual new ideas and level designs far beyond what's possible in the main game, and I imagine most people haven't heard of it. But I actually do remember a bit more about this, and it clicked when seeing who developed this. Six cents. Does the Razor Hydra ring any bells to anyone? I remember it being a relatively big deal around the game's release, and it was basically a PlayStation Move-style controller, but for PC. 
Well, alongside Hydra Support and Portal 2 was the Sixth Sense Motion Pack, and although it has a different name, it is the exact same as Portal 2 in Motion for PlayStation 3. And given the Hydra went out of production 8 years ago and there's only 2 listings on eBay worldwide, and according to this guy on Reddit, you need a brand new unused Hydra with a serial number that you email to the company who made the Hydra, who then email you back with a redemption code for 9 year old DLC that is unobtainable otherwise, and I doubt they even have it anymore, I think the PlayStation 3 is the easier route to go. Is it still the best console version like Gabe said a decade ago? Well, technically no, but this move stuff makes it essential for anyone who loves Portal 2. There's even more of the game in here that most people have never touched. But we touched on a few other console games there, so let's rewind back a little bit. Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Did you forget this had a console version? Because I nearly did. It was the second and final in line of the unprecedented PlayStation 3 partnership, and just like Portal 2, it had Steam support, and just like Portal 2, it no longer works. You can still play online on 360. Doesn't mean you'll find anyone, but you can. One of the weirdest parts is the PS3 version never actually launched in Europe, so I had to go through the American store to get this. Valve apologized to Eurogamer for the delay back in 2012. Maybe they'll let them know when it's coming. So it's all offline now, but you can still play against bots on PS3, so I can still show you some of the cool exclusive stuff. Cat hates terrorists. You know, I'm a little bit confused about the Steam support with this one. Despite it all being integrated with achievements and news and the friends list, there's no crossplay. So I guess you can message your friends and tell them you can't play with them. Crossplay was promised the year before launch, but it got scrapped closer to the shipping date. So I guess this was a pointless feature then, and it's the undoing of the game now. Anyway, playing Counter-Strike with a controller feels very weird, but I guess most players had the same handicap. And I say most because this port had two very special things. Special thing one, just like Portal 2, PlayStation Move support, and it's actually rad here. It feels incredibly well calibrated and might even be some of my favorite examples of pointer aiming. This is awesome. But then there's also number two, mouse and keyboard support. Maybe this was a remnant of when it was meant to have crossplay with PC, but unlike 360, you can plug in any USB mouse and keyboard and play it just as if it were a PC. It does mean anyone using a controller has a big disadvantage, but Counter-Strike just feels good with these options. To be honest, I think motion and mouse are on really similar playing fields. Either are great. It made the PS3 version honestly incredibly viable. It's for sure not where most of the community went, and again, it's offline now. But it's still really fun to play around with the PlayStation Move. It is backwards compatible on Xbox, but it didn't get the 4K update on like every other Valve 360 game. Even they forgot this port existed. But let's shift away from PlayStation 3, because now we're back in the era where Gabe Flipping hated the thing. Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 may have a legacy now as PC games, but back when they were new, they were actually incredibly important parts of Xbox's lineup. I remember the first game in particular had a massive console presence, and it was also a really weird time. See, Valve updated these games quite a bit, but Microsoft had a little policy making these versions outright worse value than what Steam had. The survival pack managed to be free as a one-off, which seemed to require quite a bit of negotiation itself. But to maintain an economy of value, Microsoft enforced premium pricing for all other DLC releases. So if you want Left 4 Dead 2 to be complete on 360, you'll need to buy three different DLC packs coming to a total of £12. And that is more than the game itself costs on Steam, and there, all the DLC is free. Now, these did get 4K patches as part of backwards compatibility and run at a stable 30fps. So these aren't bad versions at all, especially today, and it's by far the easiest way to play split screen. It is in the PC version, but it's not exactly... like, simple. But over a decade after release, and Left 4 Dead's legacy isn't exactly its base content. This is a game that exists way beyond that, and the community has made so much. It's a good console port, but the only pro it really has is local play. But let's go back in time a little bit more to the original Xbox. This chunky thing was a powerhouse. While PS2 had games that looked like this, for little babies, Xbox was giving us pure PC games like Knights of the Old Republic and Morrowind and Half-Life 2. Now, this released a year after the PC version, but that's probably fine because the PC version came out the same week as Halo 2. Half-Life 2 can run on just about anything now, but back then, this was a technical marvel. No console or PC game looked like this back in 2004. The faces, the lighting, the physics, it was all breathtaking. 
and they somehow squeezed onto a console that coexisted with the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube. I mean, it didn't run well, but it ran. Yeah, this isn't exactly a good way to play Half-Life 2 today. It is impressive, and although everything has a bit of a blurrier look to it, it doesn't come together too badly. But even in scenes where nothing's going on, you can feel it chugging along. They add a ton more loading zones too. In all other versions, there's a seamless transition from G-Man's monologue to the train, but Xbox gotta load. Everything about the ambition and performance is so understandable that this one ends up being a little uninteresting. But Xbox also got Counter-Strike! I said earlier that Counter-Strike feels a bit weird with the controller, and it still does, I can't hit anything. The online went down in 2010, alongside the rest of the original Xbox Live, but you can still play with bots, so what the heck is this? Well, it's very similar to Counter-Strike Condition Zero, everyone's favourite, so the development story is just as messy. Originally, Rogue Entertainment made Condition Zero, but then Gearbox took over. But then Ritual Entertainment took over, not Rogue Entertainment, Ritual Entertainment, they're different studios, and while they were making it, Turtle Rock Studios made the AI, so they were involved, but they weren't making the actual project. But then Ritual said, we don't want to play anymore, and left the project, leaving Turtle Rock Studios to finish everything up. I wonder what went wrong with this game. Now, Counter-Strike Xbox predates Condition Zero by four months, so this was the very first sequel to Counter-Strike. They could even say it had seven exclusive maps on the back of the box, which was technically true. There's 16 maps total, nine of them are remakes from the first Counter-Strike, and while most of these maps showed up in Condition Zero four months later, they were exclusive as of this box printing, so this is not a lie. And actually, even today, one map is still exclusive, Miami. As anti-terrorists, you start off in the streets outside a bank, and you infiltrate and stop anyone holding hostages in the vaults. It's pretty good, I like it. So this is a really interesting game, because while it shared development and resources with Condition Zero, it also feels quite unique. Visuals are rather different, with colours in particular being completely changed, and gun feedback isn't quite one-to-one -one either, with some weapons feeling entirely different. And hey, this is interesting if you're someone like me, and if you're not someone like me, you might not find it interesting at all, but I do find it interesting. Condition Zero has this very traditional item menu. You just sort of select your weapons, and there you go. Pretty much like the first game. But the Xbox version has this wheel. Wee! Look at it go. But the interesting part is this resurfaced in Global Offensive, even on PC. So what I'm saying is Counter-Strike Xbox is the backbone of the entire series. It's just a fascinating little game. Counter-Strike Xbox. It sounds like it could be unique, it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. Runs really well too. It's obviously less ambitious than Half-Life 2, but this just feels far more tailored to Xbox. But while Half-Life 2 didn't perform particularly great, Valve did give a little love to a competitor, which resulted in their most interesting and greatest port yet. The original Half-Life for PlayStation 2. Half-Life PS2 launched three years after the PC original and was done by Gearbox, the same studio who did the PC expansions. And while making those expansions, they also started work on the HD pack. If you've bought the modern Steam release, you can enable this in any version of Half-Life. So here are the default standard models, and here they are with the HD pack. But it seems work on the HD pack wasn't quite finished, as Gearbox developed it even further on PlayStation 2. So again, here's a standard PC model, here's the HD pack, and now, here's PlayStation 2. Not only are the characters more defined and refined, but they actually have individual fingers now. Look at this guy typing! They have eye tracking too, it really took a jump. So why did they go further with this on PlayStation 2? Well, because the HD pack was originally intended for Dreamcast. Yeah, Half-Life for Dreamcast. It never actually released, but a near-complete build leaked online in 2003. The weirdest part is this version had some pretty extensive coverage. Lots of magazine articles with a bunch of screenshots and interviews, and it's fascinating to see that Blue Shift, before being shifted to PC, was a Dreamcast exclusive campaign. So why wasn't it released? Well, Sierra claimed changing market conditions, which could very well be true as this was intended to release in 2001, and in 2001 the Dreamcast wasn't exactly… doing well. But it was already delayed by a year for poor technical performance, and given the leaked build doesn't, like, run very well at all, it could also just be it didn't meet the standards. This is an ambitious little thing. It probably would have ran a lot better if they just stuck with the default low-poly PC models, but instead they were hell-bent on enhancing everything, but alas, it never actually released. So I guess we can call PlayStation 2 the Ultra HD pack, and unlike the Dreamcast version, it actually runs pretty well. 
It caps out at 60 FPS, but it for sure dips. So the performance isn't perfect, but graphically, this is simply better than it is on PC. You'll for sure get a cleaner HD image on PC, but the models, geometry, lighting, they're actually better on PS2. You might be saying, but hey John, what about Half-Life Source? And I'm saying, Half-Life Source is an abomination that looks really weird, why is my gun so reflective? This is Half-Life 2 water, it's really out of place, and it still doesn't have the PS2 models, I don't like Half-Life Source. Anyway, while Blue Shift was made for Dreamcast, it's not included in the PS2 version. But Gearbox did include something else because they simply couldn't shift a product without making something new apparently. And this new thing is still exclusive to PS2. It never came to PC. Half-Life Decay. A totally new, totally original co-op campaign starring Gina Cross and Colette Green. What do you mean who are they? They're the people that send the trolley thing up in Gordon's campaign. They're important. Unlike the main game, this isn't one continuous journey. Levels are designed just like Half-Life, but they're broken up into smaller, self-contained episodes. And again, this is a co-op campaign. You can play the entire thing on your own and shift back and forth between characters, but it's clearly not meant to be played that way. Although one weird quirk is while in split screen, weapon models are invisible. I guess they take out too much screen real estate or something, but this is weird, right? The two will often get split up to puzzle solve individually, and sometimes there's asymmetric puzzle solving, but you'll also just shoot a bunch of aliens together. There is a PC mod that remade Decay, but again, this never officially came to PC. Half-Life PS2 also has an exclusive competitive multiplayer mode, and I know PC has a competitive multiplayer mode, but every single map is different. These are essentially different games entirely. It is only two-player and has the same weaponless split-screen quirk as Decay, but I still played this a ton with friends back in the day. There's 10 maps in total, and for a console-exclusive side mode, that's pretty beefy. And while some are absolutely tiny, like Office, which is just these few rooms, others, like Basement, have a lot more going on. This is just another really good part of this port. Not to mention, this version fully supports mouse and keyboard too, so it's not like there's a gameplay downgrade. You get better visuals, control parity, and exclusive content. It may not be the version you play instead of PC, but anyone who loves the original needs to give this a go. It's flat out one of the best PC conversions ever made. But to end off this journey, we finally have the orange box. Clearly, Valve weren't happy with the PlayStation 3, and the port is infamously not a great way to play these games, but over on 360, this was a big deal. We'd already had a console port of Half-Life 2, but this was significantly better. Loading zones now match PC, the visuals were practically uncompromised. It was a PC quality version, but at 720p 30fps. Although every game in this is backwards compatible enhanced, so on Series X and One X, you've got a pure 4K image and significantly better load times. Look at this! Rad as flip! But the orange box was far more than just another way to play Half-Life 2. It is Episode 1's console debut, but more importantly, it was the first time release of three brand new games on the exact same day, and each were majorly important. Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Portal, and Team Fortress 2. We've had multiple great bundles like Metroid Prime Trilogy and Halo The Master Chief Collection, but none of them release multiple brand new games at once. It's like if Nintendo released a new Mario, a new Zelda, and new Splatoon games on the same day on a single cartridge. This stuff just doesn't happen, it was bonkers. And if you weren't a PC gamer at all, these were five brand new games to you. Not only that, but five of the best games of all time. And in 2022, I still see a lot of value in playing these on console. Half-Life 2 and Portal both work great with a controller, and they still look really good, especially on Series X with 4K and Auto HDR. But what makes this truly interesting over the PC version is Team Fortress 2. Valve have kept this 15-year-old game wildly active by changing so much of its DNA. In 2007, it was just part of the orange box, but in 2011, the whole thing went free to play, and monetization turned to microtransactions. Today, Team Fortress 2 looks drastically different to how it used to. Every character has multiple weapons to equip, there's tons of cosmetics, and you can end up paying significantly more than the game actually cost on its own before it went free to play on these things. It's kind of refreshing to go back to a simpler time. It's not just that Team Fortress 2 on console never went free to play, but it never really got any major updates. Valve had the exact same problem as Left 4 Dead, where Microsoft outright refused free content updates. So if Team Fortress 2 were to get new maps and modes, they would have to charge for it, and that went against the DNA of the game. In 2009, Valve dropped all support on 360, and they pretty much never supported PlayStation 3. 
So what we have here is Team Fortress 2 with the original 6 maps, and the only game modes are Capture the Flag and Control Point. Yeah, no payload or anything. People actually do still play this version, although when recording footage I seemingly picked a very bad time, so I had to send out a message for help. Thank you, Terwebs. And you know, with all the updates, Valve actually broke some stuff in Team Fortress 2 for PC, so all these models in the character selector actually look better on Xbox. I had a really good time returning to this little time capsule. It would have been nice for the orange box to support keyboard and mouse like Half-Life on PlayStation 2, but all these games suit to controller well enough, and they're just solid ports all around. So, this has been a bit of a journey. Not every console port has parity of PC, but some of them stand equally side by side, and others are just interesting for different reasons, whether that be exclusive modes, control inputs, or in the case of Half-Life PS2, better visuals. Valve may be known for their PC presence, but this is a pretty good portfolio, and hopefully we haven't seen the end. Please, Half-Life Alex, PlayStation VR 2. Again, if you're from the future, let me know if that happens.